Hi, everyone, and welcome to lecture 25, the last lecture. We are going to continue talking about transistors. Like I said last time, um, I'd like to continue a little bit more on that small signal analysis and uh, hopefully do a small example and then spend maybe half an hour, 40 minutes just very briefly touching on the physics of operation of transistors. And that's not part of our curriculum for this course, but I think it would be nice to talk about it uh, very briefly. Okay, now small signal analysis, we, we've spent a few hours talking about this, but I'm hoping that the next 10 minutes will show you that, that conceptually there isn't a whole lot there. So even if you feel like you haven't been able to catch up with things so far, in principle, the, the brief review that we, we do now should be enough, okay? So let's try to follow this very closely and attentively. And to make it more concrete, I'll start with the BJT, with an NPN BJT. Now, we've talked about how to model a device. So for an NPN BJT, which is like this, It has the base, collector, and emitter nodes. We've seen that we can model it as having a, a, a diode between the base and emitter, and then a current-controlled current source or a voltage-controlled current source, depending on uh, how you'd like to represent it, for the collector. Namely, this is what one way to do it that we talked about last time. Here I have the base node, the collector node, and the emitter node. And of course I have the VBE voltage, VCE, VCB, and all the currents. And this uh, in particular, what was interesting was the collector current here, IC, that was some saturation current multiplying an exponential of VBE over the thermal voltage VT. Nothing new here. This is the collector current. And that C I'm writing like that to emphasize that it's capital C. And of course, this is VBE, measured like this. This is the model for the BJT in the active mode for an MPN BJT. And this one is neglecting the early effect. We said that's a secondary effect. We talked about how to model it or how to incorporate it into the model last time. But it's not a, a crucial element of the basic operation. So this little review I want to do, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm doing now, I want to do without that. And so this one, I'll emphasize this is neglecting the early effect. And we saw that you could include that uh, by adding a resistor in parallel with that current source. This is, again, a current controlled current source in that direction, okay? Now here you also have the base current, of course, this is the base, the base current, IB, and this is the emitter current, IE. Again, notice I'm using small letters right now for, for the main parameter and then large uh, or uppercase for, um, for the subscripts. And this is the IC, whose value I've written there. To be complete then, IC is IS exponential of VBE by VT. And IB is simply uh, IC over beta. This is the transistor beta. And IE is simply IC over alpha. These are things that we've seen before. Nothing special. Beta is something around 100. Alpha is, say, around 
this is a, a pretty good model for, for a transistor in the active. If you want to solve for a trans, uh, transistor circuit in, in, an, in, in the active mode of the transistor, you can put this in and using these equations, these are the element relationships for the transistor and you apply your uh, circuit laws and get the answers. And of course, you could do approximations. For instance, you would know that this, this diode voltage is approximately maybe 0.7 volts. So if you want an approximation, uh, that, that would be a good approximation. In a given problem, someone might even say, look, you know, make that approximation. Assume that when the transistor is on, the base emitter voltage is about 0.7 volts. But you could use these equations to get a full numerical answer, accurate numerical answer. Now I want to go from here to small signal. Going to small signal. All we are doing in small signal is, is recognize that uh, we can think of these quantities, these variables that we are interested in as some large and constant DC component, which we call BIOS, plus some small variations. And again, I'm using that notation. For the full signal, small uh, letter, capital subscript. For the BIOS, capital letter, capital subscript. And for the small signal part, uh, all lowercase. OK? This is the small signal. In fact, you can think of this as a small variation to the full signal. You see? It's like you're write, write, writing a full signal, small i, capital C, as its bias point, capital I, capital C, plus a D, I, C. That's a small addition uh, on top of the bias. And you can think of uh, the other ones in the same manner. IB would be its bias point plus the small signal, which you can think of as some small uh, differential. Same for IE. You can think of it as this plus that. This is some small differential. Same for voltages. Uh, for VBE, for instance, you can think of it as the bias plus some small variation. And same for VCE, uh, VCB. Building a small signal model for the transistor entails building a model that connects these small signal components, the, the, the small variations around the bias point. Okay? And we did this, for instance, to get the transconductance of the transistor. So the goal is basically have a model like this for the transistor, but a model that relates not the full, uh, full uh, amount of the currents and voltages, but only their small variations. So a model that relates these sm small differential elements or those uh, circled quantities. That's the goal of small signal analysis. We also went through how to derive this, and initially we uh, we did this exercise where we would put the full signal in the equation and uh, do a little bit of algebra to see how the small components were, were related. Uh, we also recognized that you could do that through differentiation relatively easily. For instance, if you wanted to get the relationship between IC and VBE, such as what you have here, but not the relationship between full IC and full VBE, but the relationship between the small signal component of IC 
and the small signal component of VBE. So if we want to see how a small variation in VBE affects IC or creates a small variation in IC, all you have to do is differentiation, right? What is, if this is IC, what is DIC by DVBE? All right? What is that DIC by that DVBE? DIC by DVBE. It's simply the the differential, uh, the uh, the derivative of that equation. You get a one over t coming out. Okay, so it'll just become one over t times that same thing, one over t times IC. Now, if I'm interested at this quant uh, in this quantity around the bias point, so it's going to be one over VT. And uh, the rest is going to be the same, like I said. At that bias point, right? Which is going to be 1 over Vt. Sorry, what am I doing here? This was VBE, right? Now, at, at the bias point, we call this big V, big VE, like that, all right? And this is simply, by definition, the bias point um, the, the value of IC at the bias point. This is what we saw before, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. This quantity, you see, is, is the ratio of little i, little c, over little v, little ve. It's just the same thing. This is at the bias point. And this is what we call transconductance. The relationship between the small signal component of IC and the small signal component of VBE is just a ratio that's constant, a constant value depending on the bias. And that's what's going to replace this, this current source, in the small signal model. What is going to replace this diode in the small signal model? Well, I'm interested in the relationship between IB and VBE. But they're small signal components, right? So if you look at... IB, it's just 1 over beta IC. So IB is also related to VBE. It's simply IS over beta times the same exponential. So if I take that, DIB over DVBE at the bias point. I'll get everything will be the same except there will be a 1 over beta there, right? So do the same math. It's everything is the same except there is a 1 over beta. So you will get a 1 over beta times IC over VT. Or 
that IC over VT is what we call GM. So this is the ratio of small changes in the base current over small changes in the base emitter voltage. The same thing that we called little i sub little b over little v sub little e. Right? This is the same thing. It's just a different name for it. So the, for in, in small signal, we have a, a nice uh, quantity showing the ratio of the input voltage uh, or the ratio of the input current and the input voltage. So in my small signal model, what should I have at that input? How should I replace this diode? With a resistor, it's something that is just a constant for the ratio of its voltage and current. So from here, uh, you, you might define an input resistance, something called R, which is the inverse of that, which will then become beta over GM. So you have the transconductance, GM, and you have this input resistance. Is it surprising that in small signal, this diode between base and emitter ended up being represented by a resistor? What is the small signal behavior of a diode? Well, remember the diode had, a diode was like this. I versus V for a diode was something like this, right? If I'm around some operating point and I want to look at small variations here, that would correspond to some small variations here. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating this too. These are meant to be small. So the diode for small signal is being represented by a small tangent there uh, showing that straight line that's approximating that section of the diode characteristics. So it's no surprise that its small signal behavior is being represented by a ratio that. Okay? So this is, in essence, a, a quick review of a, a big chunk of what we've done. So what we are saying is that in small signal, in small signal that, that same device has been replaced by a resistor which approximates the uh, the be uh, behavior of the diode with a linear small variation, this resistor R. And in fact, this is called a pi model. So this is normally called R sub pi. I'll include that here so that you're familiar with, uh, with that definition. Now, remember, this is a small signal model. So you're talking about the small signal quantities. Notice how I went back to small or lowercase subscripts. This is IB. This is IC, small c, which we said is GM times VBE. And this is I small e. This is your base collector emitter. So in small signal behavior, your input is just the small variations of the diode, which is replaced by a resistor. And the output is the small variations of, again, an equation like the diode, but it depends on the input voltage rather than its own voltage. And that's why it has been 
replaced by a transconductance rather than a resistor. Because the current here depends on the voltage on the left, not its own voltage on the right. That's why you have a transconductance taking you from the input voltage to the output current. But of course, we see that, and again, this is not new, that these parameters for the small signal behavior, gm and r pi, these are dependent on where you are biased, the value of uh, capital I, capital C. So if you want to do small signal analysis, you have to first find a bias point, and then from there, uh, convert to a small signal af afterward. Let me write this down. This is called the hybrid pi model. Okay. To make this a little more concrete, I'd like to do an example. Very similar to the kind of circuits that we've solved before. To hopefully make this more concrete. Let's say I have 10 volts here. One kilo ohm here. One kilo ohm here. All right. Here I'll put 17 ohms. All right. And 83 ohms. And here I will, I will apply a small signal V in. And I'm interested to find at this output node, which has the total voltage V out. Now consider the fact that V out is the total voltage at the output. It can be written as a bias point plus a small signal component. Big V out plus little V out. Well, the question is to find, first of all, the bias point, and then from there, and then from there, the small signal gain, little v out over that little v in. This is what I'm interested in doing. And this would be basically the, the small signal gain or amplification factor of this circuit. So I'd like to ask you guys to think about this for a few minutes, and then we'll do it together. And assume that that capacitor has a very large capacitance. That's just a coupling capacitor. As we uh, discussed last time, that capacitor blocks the DC. In DC, that capacitor is... Um, is basically an open circuit, but it allows any uh, rapid variations in V in. So if you had a, an AC signal, it allows those to appear on this input node. Now maybe just to make it easier, and maybe this is somewhat implied by the fact that I haven't actually given you, for instance, the quantity I sub S, the saturation current of that diode. So I haven't really given you much detail about that diode. Maybe that implies, but if not, I'll say explicitly, 
for the purposes of solving this, assume that that diode, when it's on, is around 0.7 volts. Okay, so in, in DC operation, we can assume that that's around 0.7 volts as an approximation. Okay. All right, let's give it a try together. I'd just like to do exactly what we described before. First, analyze the DC or BIOS, and then find out those parameters for the small signal model. In DC, the capacitor, in DC steady state, we should say, There are biases. The capacitor acts like an open circuit. My circuit is reduced to this. I have the 10 volts here. My two resistors here, 83 ohms. 17 ohms, 1 kilo ohm, one kilo ohm. Now I'm talking about DC, so I'm specifically referring to this as big V, big out. That's the DC value. Well, first of all, and, and this is very much like examples we've done in the past, so I'll do it quickly. But it would be very uh, convenient and easy if we could find the base uh, voltage or the, the voltage at the base node here, because then we would know that the emitter node is about 0.7 volts below that, and that would directly give us the emitter current. And then we know that the collector current is going to be close to the emitter current. And so that would give us V out. Now there is, of course, a. Now you see I'm, I'm using all capital because I'm talking about the bias point. There's this IB there. And then there's these two currents here. But very often we choose things such that IB is very small compared to those. So I'll start hoping that that's the case. Because if IB is very small, then I have a voltage division there. Very small compared to, let's say, this I1. Basically, neglecting IB, I'll have a simple voltage division. To get the base vo voltage. VB. Right? If IB is negligible compared to I1. But this assumption is to be verified, of course. So in that case, what will VB be? VB will simply be 17 over 17 plus 83 times 10, which is how much? Which will then give me an approximate value of VE which will then give me an approximate value of the emitter current and that of the collector current. 
and V out will be 10 volts minus 1 kilo ohm times 1 milliamp. which is 9 volts. Now I have to check two things, as we've seen before. Is this transistor inactive? Well, yes, because VCE is 9 minus 1. I have 8 volts on the collector emitter drop, so the transistor is inactive. VCE is 9 minus 1, which is 8 volts, which is far greater than 0.4 volts. So, yes, that assumption checks out. The other approximation that I made was, or assumption, was that IB was going to be negligible compared to I1. Now, what is IB? Let's say if my beta was 100. Again, the sort of typical value, VB of 0.7, beta of 100. Is this is not I sub S? This is is IB much smaller than that I1 in in that voltage divider? Let's see. Well, IB is IC over beta, so it's approximately 1 milliamp over 100. So that's approximately, well, that's 0 0.01 milliamp, right? What is I1 in that approximation? Well, it's just 10 volts divided by the sum of these two resistors. So that's 10 over 100, right? That's a, a tenth point 0.1 amp, right? 10 over 100, point 0.1 amp, which is and this was within that approximation. So this is 100 milliamps. So yes, that assumption checks out. That question of whether or not IB was much smaller than I1, yes, indeed. It's 10,000 times smaller. So that was a very good approximation to make. So I've calculated my bias point correctly. As always, please double check my numbers. So indeed, I have found the bias point and the, the values of IC and IE and all that at bias. So now I want to look at an AC small signal uh, behavior. I'll redraw my circuit in AC small signal, where I am interested to include not the full values of these quantities, but only little changes. So when <clears throat> this V in at the input changes rapidly with time, but the amount of change itself is small. So let's say V in is you know tens of microvolts then what is the changes, or what are the corresponding changes at the different uh, nodes? What are the changes in the voltage, uh, in, in the node voltages, as well as the currents? And in particular, I'm interested in the ratio of those small changes at the output uh, for the output node voltage uh, 
over the input, uh, uh, input voltage. So now I'll draw the small signal model where I, I will replace the transistor with a small signal model and everything else. Well, in, in small signal, rapid variations of small signal, the capacitor, as we discussed last time, acts as a coupling. If this is a large enough capacitor, it will be represented pretty much by a short circuit. The 10 volt at the top is not changing. That's a fixed 10 volts, so its small signal component is zero. So that node becomes ground in small signal, it's zero. And then I'll put in the transistor model. So I have the input signal, V in. I have this resistor here, 83 ohms. But this node, its small signal uh, value becomes zero. This is my 17 ohms. Here I have the transistor, and I'll put in that pi model. So this will be R sub pi, and this will be the current source with the tra transconductance, Gm, where this is my, this here is my base node. And then the rest of the circuit, I have the 1K resistor here and another 1K resistor there. So this is my output. Notice I'm using the small signal representation of the output. And this is the 1K resistor in the output node. You see, this is exactly that circuit for small signal variations. I have just redrawn that circuit, but replaced the various components with their behavior in small signal. The capacitor behaved like a short circuit. The input is just a small signal in itself. I've kept it there. The 10 volt DC power supply at the top, its small signal component is zero, so it has been replaced by ground. The resistances have been kept. And for the transistor, I have included the pi model. And of course, I need to know the values of gm and r pi. GM was this. And remember, my collector current, my BIOS, and this, by the way, this should have capital C. My collector BIOS was 1 milliamp. Over thermal voltage, which is, it's 26 milli electron volts approximately. Very, very often uh, you might say 25 milli electron volts uh, or milli volts in this case. So GM is one over 25 amp per volt. One over 25 is, uh, is what? It's 40 milli amp per volt, uh, right? Did I get that correctly? 40 milli amp per volt? Is that right? And R pi was simply beta by GM. We already calculated that. So that's 100 over 40 milliamp, milliamps per volt. So that would be 2.5 kilo ohms. That's it. The rest is a very simple exercise in circuit analysis. You have a circuit. You have V in at that node. Then there is a 2.5 kilo ohms there. Let me write that down with a different color. 
and the GM became uh, 40 times VBE units is milliamps per volt. So I hope this is a very easy circuit to solve. If I want the ratio of V out over V in here, it's a pretty straightforward circuit problem. You see that V in is applied directly to base in this case, actually. So the 17 ohm and 83 ohm resistors don't, don't have an effect here because that node voltage is directly determined by V in. So of course, there will be some small signal current going through those resistors, but um, the, the base, um, base node voltage is directly V in. So your problem is basically this. So it's like this. This is directly V in. You can define this as I V. You see, this is all small signal quantities. This is I sub E. And you have the collector current there. That's GM times VBE, 4D times VBE. All right? And V out is simply minus 1, 1K one times the collector current, right? So I'll write, so, so for instance, at the input, I can write a KVL. That's minus V in plus R pi IB plus that 1K IE is 0 plus R pi, which was 2.5K IB plus 1K IE is 0. That's a KVL. I have a KCL, of course. IB plus IC are um, IE. And th then I have the output node voltage. zero minus one K times IC, which is minus one K times GMVBE. So minus that times 40 milli times VBE. So it's minus 40 VBE. And uh, yeah, the, the KCL, which is IE is the sum of IB and IC, which is 40 milli times VBE. This is milli. Okay. And finally, at the input, of course, we also have VBE is R pi times IE, which is uh, sorry, IB, which is two and a half K times IB. I hope I didn't forget anything. Basically just wrote my KVLs, KCLs, and element relationships. You have IE, IB, VBE, and V out as the unknowns like the many, many other problems that you've solved. OK, let me, let me just summarize that. For a given V in, the unknowns here, IB, IE, VBE 
and V out. By solving this small system of equations, you will find all of these, including V out, in terms of V in. And then from there, calculate the ratio, which is your small signal voltage gain. OK? Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I did not have this milli there. And then in the other equation, i.e., yeah, here, here I have it. This is just a GM in the next one, yeah. All right, so all you have to do is you want, you know, V out, but you can solve this in, in any order of things. So let's say replace VBE in terms of IB and, um, IE also, then you get rid of VBE and then again eliminate IB and IE and you're left with B out. But solving this is just like anything else you've done. It has nothing to do with small signal. Okay, so I hope this serves as a uh, case study, as an example of going through all, all the steps. This basically summarizes how you start with a full model for the transistor, construct a small signal model for it. And last time, we, we also saw that there's other ways of modeling the transistor. It's not necessarily uh, in the shape, uh, sh uh, form of a pi. There's that other model that we started with. That's called the T model. But now, you see, if you take a course in electronics, you will go through all of these, and you will go through uh, all sorts of variations of designs of circuits amplifier using this configuration with this kind of biasing using that type of model for the transistor and so on. That takes a long time to go through. You need a full course for that. And that's not our purpose here. I do not expect you guys to memorize any of these things. Okay? What I want you to see is a way of thinking about circuits. The, the, the progression, the way we make these models, the way we make um, approximations, and the way we separate the bias and the small signal. You know, this would be called a common emitter amplifier. And if you look at textbooks, there is going to be a section that's called common emitter amplifier. And they'll do these things parametrically, and they'll give you a formula for the common emitter amplifier gain. And then they'll do another one a formula for the common base amplifier gain, another, another one, common collector, with all sorts of variations. So if you open a chapter in textbooks on these things, it could look very daunting. So if you do that, which I encourage you to do, of course, but don't assume that you need to know off the top of your head all those variations. That's not the purpose here, right? The purpose is just to see how these things are done. And like I said, this is the boundary for this course going into AC. So we barely touch it. But um, it's really the approach that's of interest and the ability to, to do this kind of thing, not knowing a large number of them off the top of your head. That's when you specialize in electronics and become an electronics design engineer, and you do all of that. Okay. Now, before closing this and taking a short break, I now want to ask you guys, if I wanted to make a small signal model for the MOSFET, how would things be different? So if I start going through the same exercise. Starting from here, what would the full signal model be for the MOSFET? Well, we saw that it's very similar, except that the equation is, instead of an exponential, it's a uh, quadratic, inactive, in the active mode, right? 
uh, which for the MOSFET we call saturation. And we saw that the input was, for DC, was an open circuit. The base current was zero. So it's a simpler model, in fact. For the MOSFET, for an n-channel MOSFET, have the gate, source, and drain. This was modeled basically with this. If this was your and again, this is the full signal VGS. This was inactive, or uh, yeah, model inactive, which is really saturation for, for the MOSFET. This was, the, the, the current here was half of some quantity that we called K. This is your W over L mu C ox. VGS minus the threshold voltage. This is not the thermal voltage, but the threshold voltage. Okay? Well, now if you were to build a small signal model for this, you would do the same things that we did for the BJT. You would take the same derivatives, and uh, you would take derivatives in the same way, except that Instead of taking the derivative of that exponential, you're taking the derivative of this uh, quadratic behavior. So using steps similar to the BJT, for the small signal model. You will get a GM. And we've done this before, so I'll just write it down. But we saw the GM of the MOSFET before. But it's just the derivative of this The derivative of ID over uh, uh, VG, uh, with respect to the VGS at the bias point, which then, if you take the derivative, it will just be the two cancels out. You'll get K times VGS minus VT at bias. And again, we've seen this before. And again, this is the threshold voltage, not the thermal voltage of the VJT. This is the threshold. All right? What will the input resistance be in this case? So for, for the BJT, we came up with that R pi, which was uh, an input resistance. What would the input resistance be in this case? In small signal. Well, the current is zero, right? So even if you make small variations in the circuit, the variations in the current of gate will be zero, right? So no matter if you change VGS, you know, no matter how you do that, the current will not change in steady state. So the input resistance is infinity because there is zero current. This is the gate current. 
Okay, so it's it's the same model as in the BJT, except except with new uh, values. So the small signal model is like this. Now you notice that I'm using small subscripts as well. Again, this is not new. We did this exercise in the past, but for completion, uh, for completeness, I'm including it. So in fact, it's even easier. I'll just point out one thing, and that's maybe, again, a little bit of a detail at this point. If you are doing, if you're going to do something like uh, AC analysis, so your small signal is not a quasi-static change, but it's rapid variations in time, then technically, the base current will not be zero, right? Because the, uh, sorry, the, the, the gate current. Because at the gate, your input is a capacitance. And when you have time varying signals, there will be a current in the capacitor, dV by dt, right? So, but, but the point is, this capacitor at the base has a very, very small value typically. So at relatively, uh, relatively low frequencies, that gate current will be, at the, that the gate current will be negligible. That's why people do use this. But you have to be careful about it. So I'm just saying that for you to be aware of, that there is a caveat here. But at the, at the level that we are discussing, this is good enough. Okay? So we are essentially neglecting any gate current and saying the input resistance is infinity, even in small signal, even if it's AC. And then you can do examples like you did for uh, the BJT. Of course, one could go on and on, but I think this is a good place to wrap up this discussion. And if you guys would like to take a five minute break, then we'll talk a little bit about the physics of these devices. Yeah, so that's this. Uh, sorry, not zero. But correction here is infinity. Important correction here, uh, input resistance is not zero, it's open, it's infinite, right? Let, let's start. I noticed that I had a, a very bad typo here. I had said the input resistance is zero. No, if the current is zero, it means the input resistance is infinity. So I corrected that. It's, it's an open circuit, right? It's not zero resistance, it's infinity. So note that. Like I said, this wraps up the discussion. Now, although what I did was, like I said, a sort of complete description, but please make sure you go through the previous lectures because there we spent more time discussing these concepts. And so to be able to follow this uh, and gain deeper understanding, uh, it, it's, it's not enough to go through this one hour, okay? Really don't neglect the previous lectures. So this formally concludes our discussion the next half an hour or 40 minutes uh, is not part of the syllabus, okay? So hopefully a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, hopefully you have a little bit of interest in seeing how some of these devices work as far as the physics of operation is concerned. And of course, that's something that you can spend your whole uh, career on or at the very least a, a couple of courses and we'll spend half an hour on it. And what I'm hoping to give you is a brief and very high level overview, but hopefully not an incorrect one, okay? So I'm not, I'm not giving you a, um, a simplified model that's not correct. I, I'll attempt to give you the correct physics, but at a very high level, not at a level that you can use to go become a device design engineer, okay? But, and this is where things start. 
things actually start in a resistor. Now, this is an element that we all feel comfortable with, hopefully. But I think I mentioned last time that the physics of resistors is far from trivial. You can, again, to really understand how a resistor works, that V equals Ri, again, you need all the same solid state physics that you need for the other elements. But a very simple overview of this is that we know there is a conductor here. And in a conductor, there are electrons, free electrons. And if you apply a voltage across this element, you set up an electric field. And that electric field will set free electrons or relatively free electrons into motion. So if your voltage is like this, electrons will want to go this way. And that's why the current which we think of as flow of positive charge, is in that direction. Now, it turns out, it, it was observed, and it is confirmed experimentally, that for a large range of materials, conductors, the voltage and current are proportional for a large range of voltages and currents. This is not true for all values of V and I and all materials, regardless of their size. If you make a very small resistor, a nanoscale device, things will be very different. Okay? But we had a V equals Ri. That was really a consequence of these electrons moving like that. We had a similar picture for a capacitor, but there was a gap in between. So electrons would go on one, onto one plate and leave the other plate and you would end up with a uh, charge uh, stored in that device. And for an inductor, you had, again, the flow of electrons in that conductor, and the current created a magnetic field. But how do we go from this to a diode? Now, the idea of a diode is that it lets current go in one direction and not in the other, right? Here is one way to create a diode. If you create a vacuum chamber, and you put two electrodes inside. So this is something like your light bulb, and there are two, two uh, electrodes on the two, uh, in inside with a gap. If you heat one of these up, if you make this one hot, if you heat it to 2,000 degrees, it will start, you know, eventually materials want to melt and boil, right? But some of them, before they get to that point, they will start boiling off their electrons. So some electrons will start going through. They will be emitted like this. These are electrons. And by the way, this happens in your light bulb. When you turn on the light, there are electrons also being boiled off of the filament. But in your light bulb, you don't have a collector to collect them. The, um, yeah. But again, that's a kind of... Now, over 100 years ago, people figured out this, that they could apply a voltage difference here. And that would create a field that would attract these electrons, right? Because this side is positive, this side is negative. If you reverse the field, there won't be a current because there's no electrons being emitted from the other one. You have an electron emitter, an emitter, notice the word. It's also called an electron source. Take note of that. And you have a plate here that's called an electron collector, also hopefully sounds familiar. So you have electrons 
This device will let things go one way but not the other because the other one is, so, so this electrode here is hot, this one is cold. So the, the cold one is not emitting electrons. So if you reverse the field, there's no current. This is a diode, a vacuum diode in this case. Formally in invented, I think, in 1904. All right? And this is basically what started the electronics industry on a massive scale. And this went on for about half a century. And it's still going on, by the way. There are still very sophisticated variations of these devices being used in, uh, not, not just this, with multiple other electrodes and magnetic fields and stuff, being used in very high speed, high power ampli amplifiers and so on, radar, satellite, things like that. If you ever hear of uh, devices called klystrons and gyrotrons and things like that, they are essentially variations of this. But around half a century ago, this, which is really, you know, and by the way, there are some of these in the hallways of the department that you can check out in the windows, display windows. This was replaced, uh, well, uh, more than half a century ago. This was replaced by um, solid state diodes. Now the idea of a solid state device is to do away with the complications of this. You know, you have to create a vacuum tube, you have to get those electro, uh, electrodes in, you have to heat up one side to 2,000 degrees. This is not a simple device. If you wanted to build large circuits based on this, you would end up with a building to have, uh, you know, for a small computer. So a solid state diode wants to accomplish the same thing, but inside the material, inside bulk solids. And for that, you use what's called a semiconducting material. The most famous being silicon, and hence our silicon-based technology. This is how a solid state diode works. You want to have two sides, and you want electrons to be able to go from one side to the other, but not the other way around. So you take what's called a semiconductor, a piece of material, that's called a semiconductor. And the property of a semiconductor is this, that if you go around, and every so often, every now and then, or every here and there, rather, you replace one of its atoms by some other atom, which you call doping. So let's say you have silicon, but you know one out of every million silicon atoms that you have, you replace with a phosphorus atom. Now if you look at the, the electronic structure of phosphorus, you will see that in its outer shell it will have one more electron than silicon. So when you do this, that additional electron of the phosphorus atom is not needed to, uh, for, for the covalent bonding with the neighboring silicon atoms. It will become loose and it will start moving around easily. So by doing this, you actually are, are able to increase the degree of conductivity of the material. So by this is called doping, basically. You add some atoms to it that have more electrons than the silicon lattice needs for bonding. And so these extra electrons start moving around easily. You can also do the opposite. You can add another atom. So for, for silicon, typically it would be boron. If you add boron, in its outer shell, it has one less electron than silicon. So its bonding with the neighboring silicon uh, atoms will not be complete. It's constantly looking to steal an electron from 
other silicons nearby. And so if you do this, you will end up with a deficiency of mobile electrons inside the material. Now, if you do this and you bring these two things in, in contact, so imagine you have silicon here of n-type, and n-type means doped with, let's say, phosphorus, so you have an excess of mobile electrons, and another piece of silicon, but of p-type, which means a shortage of mobile electrons, then what do you think happens near that junction? You have a material that's, that's got extra loose electrons to move around, and another one next to it that, that's really uh, looking to grab onto electrons. What happens is some charge transfer here. Some electrons, excess electrons, will go from here to there. Now, if I look near that junction, if some electrons have left this material and entered this material, or have, have left the left side and entered the right-hand side, now I'm left with a charge deficiency or a charge imbalance. Deficiency on the left-hand side and uh, excess on the right-hand side. So what ends up happening is this. I end up with some electrons that made it to the right-hand side, and they left some positive charge behind. And the net charge is zero. You can think of it really as this. Effectively, if you have phosphorus and boron, boron wants to pull an electron from the phosphorus, right? But this is done. The bo boron atoms want to take the electrons. The phosphorus atoms want to give, it, give them away in this lattice. And so you end up with this picture. Now look at that. You have a layer of positive charge and a layer of negative charge. That sets up an electric field. That's like a capacitor, actually, right? Sets up an electric field. It's a dipole. So if you look at the electrostatic potential, if you look at the electric potential as a function of, as a function of that position, I'm trying to call that the x-axis. If you look at the electrostatic potential, or electric potential, let's say, experienced by an electron, felt by an electron. In that direction, x, if you call this let's say potential felt as a function of x for, for an electron, which side would have a higher potential? Which side would the electron need a higher potential energy to be in? Where you have negative charge, right? Because negative charge wants to repel more electrons. So you end up with something like this. Wherever has a lower potential, the electrons want to be there. Lower potential energy. The slope of potential is the electric field. You might not remember this from your electrostatics, but that's what it is. So you see that there is a barrier, a potential barrier set up that will prevent electrons from, from uh, prevent further electrons from crossing over. So when you make this contact, initially some electrons make it to the right, and then the field that they set up will create this barrier which prevents any other electron that you have here from being able to go to the other side. Because now this electron will have to surmount this potential barrier to go there. Think about going up the slope of a potential field, a, a gravitational potential. Same picture. 
Now, you see, electrons in the material, they don't all have the same kinetic energy. In fact, even in a material at room temperature, some of the electrons are moving very, very fast. They have a thermal distribution. So in fact, there are some electrons that are moving around so fast that they have enough kinetic energy to overcome this barrier. But you can help them greatly by reducing this barrier. The way you reduce this barrier is by applying a voltage. If I take this device and I apply a voltage like this, I reduce this barrier greatly. Maybe I should do this in blue. I will reduce this barrier by applying that potential. And by reducing the height of this potential barrier, there will be more and more electrons that have enough kinetic energy just moving around in the lattice that will cross over. And that's why you get a current in the diode. The reason the behavior of the current is exponential is the thermal distribution of the electrons inside the material. And they follow Fermi-Dirac statistics. Again, that's a big topic. But this is what happens in a diode. Now, if you reverse the potential, the, the applied potential, you actually make the barrier taller. So you prevent electrons from going. And that's the reverse bias of a diode. If you do forward bias, you make the barrier smaller, and you allow more electrons to go from one side to the other. That's the forward bias. Now, a BJT, let's say N channel, uh, N NPN, is N type, P type, N type. Again, could be made out of silicon. By the way, these are schematics, right? This is not exactly the physical structure of the device. This is just a schematic. Can I finish this? Because we have only five minutes. So if I plot the potential difference or, or the electrostatic potential across this, it will look, now I have two of these barriers. And again, this is the potential for electrons. It will look like this. In the active mode, this is what happens. In the active mode, you are reducing this barrier because this is your oh, emitter, base, and collector. In the active mode, you are reducing this barrier by applying, by forward biasing the base emitter diode. Applying a forward bias to that diode in the same manner that we did here. And you will end up re reducing this barrier. So you will start getting electrons go through. Again, the electrons that have enough kinetic energy to surmount that potential barrier. Your collector base diode, on the other hand, is reverse bias. So that barrier is actually getting even taller. But you don't care, because these electrons, once they make it over this barrier, they will diffuse, find their way here. And when they find their way here, then they just roll down the hill on the other side. So remember, we were saying you know, the, the base collector diode is, is reverse biased. So how come there is a current through it? Because the current that goes through it is actually the electrons that have been injected from the emitter. Okay. Now you see how 
the value of that current is controlled by the height of the base emitter diode. And if you keep reversing this collector side more and more, to first degree, that current does not change, neglecting the early effect. But if you forward bias the base collector diode, then you are uh, pushing the right-hand side up, and you will start injecting a current in the opposite direction, and that's where your overall current goes down. That's where the transistor starts um, getting into the saturation mode. Okay. This is, of course, a very qualitative description, but this is what, what happens. Okay. Obviously, we are not doing justice to the physics of transistors, but the, the story is not incorrect. Now let's look at an N-channel MOSFET, the way it works. Here's one way, typically, uh, you show the structure. You have, let's say, a p-type silicon here. You have two sections, n-type here and here. And here you have a gate. So this is your gate. And this is just some insulator here. Here is your source, and here is your drain. If I look at the electrostatic potential that the electrons feel along that axis, it looks like this. Again, maybe I should uh, draw it here, going through this. The rest is just the bulk of the structure along the x-axis there, I have again an MPN structure, right? So I have the same potential structure. I have these potential barriers for the electrons. If I apply a positive gate voltage to this, if, if I make that gate electro, uh, electrode positive, it wants to attract more electrons. And so what happens is electrons from this bulk that is p-type, although it doesn't have too many electrons, but whatever it has will, com will be compelled to go through uh, uh, close to the gate. So there will be electrons here that, that will start moving up and eventually form a layer of excess electrons here. On the energy landscape, the equivalent is an effective reduction in barrier height. And if you apply more positive voltage to the drain, that's fine, because you're just doing this. Again, a similar picture to this. And the way you think of it, is that you have set up a channel of electrons, hence the name N channel there, that essentially now looks more or less like a resistor, but not, not quite having the, the formula of the resistor. But there's that, those excess electrons there that have formed a channel that en enables conduction between the source and the drain. And in terms of the potential landscape, this is what it looks like. It amounts to having lowered the barrier there. And again, you will allow conduction there. Now, what happens is that the drain source voltage will have a direct effect because it will bend this barrier and pull the electrons. And that's why you see its, its uh, importance in the formula for the device in the IV characteristics. But this is sort of the very high-level overview of what happens. Now, again, 
we have not covered device physics yet, OK? But I hope it gives you a flavor. And um, this is really just qualitative for us to kind of have an introduction into what goes on inside these devices. All right, guys, thank you very much.